isn't that the cutest thing you ever saw? Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. Today I wanted to try something a little bit different and rather than doing a deep dive on one particular tornadic event, I wanted to talk about multiple events. Over the years there have been certain tornadoes or events that I've seen in video or read about in literature that have always stuck with me. You will notice after watching my channel for a while that I tend to cover events that are in a way shocking or have some sort of enigmatic nature. And that's because I've always enjoyed things that are in a way bizarre or inexplicable. There's something particularly perplexing about certain tornado events. And I think that's what draws me into these stories and events. So with that being said today, I want to talk about my top 10 tornado events that have always left me a little unsettled. Manchester, South Dakota isn't on this list simply because it was hit by a tornado. It was destroyed and never came back to life. It's a tornado ghost town. Manchester, originally known as Fairview, was born in the 19th century from the thriving railroad industry. It wasn't long after the turn of the 20th century that Manchester saw its peak with a few hundred residents and all the businesses necessary to run a quaint town. But economic hardships suffocated the small town. And by 1944, the railroad that was once the foundation of the town's prosperity officially shut down and by the turn of the 21st century, only 100 residents remained. And that brings us to the final fatal blow. On June 24th, 2003, a tornado outbreak, now known to the locals as Tornado Tuesday, would produce over 67 tornadoes within just eight hours one of which was an F4 tornado that formed just south of Manchester. The massive tornado engulfed the entire town of Manchester with over 200 mile per hour winds. The town and its outdated buildings were no match for the storm. Incredibly, there were only four reported injuries. And while it seems like a miracle that there were no fatalities, the tornado had taken the life of the very town itself. The town of Manchester, which was already a weak memory to most, never rebuilt. Just the next year in 2004, Manchester was officially disincorporated by the state. Today, the remains of the town are still present. There is a monument for the town of Manchester to sort of memorialize it, and you can still go through today and see it. One notable piece of information about this tornado is that it actually holds a Guinness World Record for having the greatest pressure drop ever measured within a tornado. And this was measured by none other than Tim Samaras. He's often said that this is one of his greatest accomplishments in storm chasing, rightfully so, especially considering he had dropped the probe just 82 seconds before the tornado actually hit the instrument. Manchester really just quietly disappeared into obscurity and I find that to be so bone chilling. Of the world's worst tornado tragedies in recorded history, while tornadoes in the United States usually hold the most discussion, actually, some of the most violent and deadly tornadoes come from Bangladesh. In fact, geographically, Bangladesh has one of the most conducive environments in the world for tornado formation. Bangladesh averages about six tornadoes per year, and unfortunately, Bangladesh's propensity for a short-lived yet particularly violent tornado season means that events that do happen here can and will be particularly devastating. One of the most critical elements to consider and to discuss when we look at tornadoes in Southeast Asia and in other countries generally is the disproportionately lesser amount of resources they have to both prepare and adequately handle tornadoes as they happen. So that means even an EF2 or EF3 rated tornado has exponentially more consequences. And that's one of the many tragic truths about tornadoes in Bangladesh. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about the deadliest tornado in recorded history. 
On April 26, 1989, what is widely believed to be an F5 intensity tornado struck the Manikanj district in Bangladesh. The twister struck the town with estimated wind speeds over 200 miles per hour, over one mile in width, and traveling over 50 miles in total. This violent tornado carved through the regions of Manikanj and Satria, where the most intense damage occurred in just an hour and a half. 1,300 fatalities would occur, 12,000 more would be injured, and over 80,000 people would lose their homes. Those numbers are so, they're appalling numbers, and frankly, quite hard to fathom 1,300 deaths. And it's also widely understood that the fatalities backed by eyewitness reports are much higher than the official recorded totals. The aftermath photos are just so gut-wrenching. Tornado destruction is already difficult to look at and to digest when it happens here at home. But when we look at a tornado disaster in another country, especially like Bangladesh, there's a whole different subset of issues when we start talking about a disaster of this magnitude in a country with less resource to provide relief. Outside of destroying tens of thousands of homes, this tornado completely destroyed essential crops, thousands of livestock, on top of that, prior to this specific tornado event in April, the area had already been experiencing a particularly difficult drought for the past six months, then promptly being followed by one of the most devastating tornado events in recent history. This is simply one of the worst, if not the worst, tornado tragedy in recorded history. I find this one so disturbing, not only because the death toll was so high, this is an example of the devastating potential of a violent tornado in an area like Bangladesh, where you have a densely populated region that is more susceptible and doesn't have access to proper shelter. And truly, there are so many tornadoes that happen in countries outside of the United States like China and Bangladesh that are never surveyed, never measured with proper instrumentation, and we will simply never know the true magnitude of. I think it's sad that this one doesn't get covered more because it's not one of those classic American tornadoes, but truly it was a tragedy unmatched. The story of the town of Glacier, Texas is wrought with disaster and ill fate. Glacier, Texas, like many small towns born in the 19th and 20th centuries, was born through the arrival of the railway in 1887. By 1915, the town was reaching its peak, bustling with a population just over 300 and all the buildings that it needed to thrive and be successful. But the period of prosperity would be very short-lived. In 1916, Glacier would experience its first major tragedy. A large fire broke out in the middle of town, destroying all of the essential businesses. By 1920, the population of Glacier, Texas would drop to less than half of what it had been just a few years prior. And tragedy would only continue for the ill-fated town. On April 9th, 1947, a now infamous day in the weather enterprise, a series of storms would go on to produce violent tornadoes that would devastate multiple towns. During the outbreak, one of the most intense storms would move directly over the town of Glacier. Some eyewitnesses report this tornado within the storm being over two miles in width. The tornado would completely devastate the town and cause 17 fatalities. With little warning of the storm, people barely had time to get into shelter. It's also reported that two people who were together were found some three miles apart after the tornado. The series of twisters would then move into the border and eventually into Oklahoma where they would continue to cause widespread damage to multiple towns and cause ultimately dozens of fatalities. This would include the infamous Woodward tornado where an estimated 107 people would lose their lives as well. After the outbreak, Glacier was devastated. With the population already having significantly dropped through decades of hardship, there was barely anything left to rebuild. By 1959, the post office would close and a few years later, there were no reported businesses operating in Glacier. 
and sometime after, there's no exact pinpoint when, but the town of Glacier would ultimately become known as a ghost town. This is another example of a ghost town that you can go see today. I believe that the jail cell building is still standing and you can go see that if you want. It is one of the only, if not the only remaining structure in the area. Tornadoes in Italy are quite rare, but we are talking about anomalous events today. The Sicilian tornadoes of 1851 were so powerful and mystifying that they almost seem like an old legend. In early December of 1851, two tornadoes are said to have formed near Marsala as they approached land. The city's port, important businesses were all destroyed as the water spouts moved inland. Ships ports, important businesses, people's homes, and lives were all lost both on the water as they moved inland and in the city itself. Not only that, extremely heavy rain and hail caused extensive damage to the areas surrounding it, which would ultimately cause damage to crops, livestock, and essential farmland. The death toll is estimated between 200 and 500. Some resources even claiming up to 700 fatalities from this singular event. It's written that the Sicilian twisters are the oldest ever documented on Italian soil. Without pictures and only relying on the stories of the Sicilian tornadoes, many of the interpretations of this event are done through drawings and I find them to be so fascinating. Like I said, they give off this really old, almost fabled feeling to them. And I can't imagine what it must have been like to experience tornadoes of this magnitude um, without any kind of warning or perhaps even any understanding of what they actually really were. On April 12th through 13th of 2020, an outbreak, now known as the 2020 Easter outbreak, tore through the southeastern United States with over 141 confirmed tornadoes, 32 fatalities, and $3 billion in damage. This was a major event. At 3.39 p.m. on April 12th, what is now known to be the infamous Basefield Soso tornado touched down. And although this tornado largely went through rural areas, it was frighteningly violent, slabbing homes and uprooting trees along the way. This tornado would carve through 68 miles in five different counties in the state of Mississippi. Ultimately, this tornado would garter an EF4 rating with eight fatalities within this one single tornado. The National Weather Service Damage Survey found the tornado's peak width to be 2.25 miles, making it the largest tornado on record in Mississippi and frankly, one of the widest in recorded history. This one is particularly eerie and horrifying to me for a very specific reason. There are a lot of tornadoes that happen out there in the open that absolutely have the potential to set records and be the next Moore or El Reno, but they just don't hit anything. They are in their own right particularly terrifying because we're at their complete mercy. Whether or not they're going to hit a town, at what time and all you can do is wait through it and hope that it doesn't tear through a populated area. There's long been this myth that tornadoes can't form or cross over water or mountains, which leaves some areas protected, which is simply not true. And the Great Natchez tornado is a terrifying example of this very thing. The 1840 Great Natchez tornado is the second deadliest in American history and is one of the earliest recorded examples of why tornadoes can and will move over bodies of water. The day started out as excessively sultry. By 1 o'clock p.m. near Concordia, a massive tornado forms moving northeast along the Mississippi River. It's said that this powerful twister moving alongside the river stripped the forest completely from 
both shore sides. The tornado then hits Natchez Landing, throwing 116 of the 120 total flatboats docked in the river, ultimately drowning most of the crew members and passengers. Other boats that were inland were thrown. One report claims a piece of a steamboat was found some 30 miles away from its original port. Some 48 people were reported to have been killed on land, with another 269 fatalities occurring on the river. Few dispute that the death toll was likely much higher than the official count, one reason being due to the amount of bodies that were presumably lost in the river, another reason being that at the time, slaves were not counted on the death toll. The death toll was likely much higher than the some 300 that were officially reported. At the time, the free trader stated that, quote, reports have come in from Louisiana and the rage of the tempest was terrible. Hundreds killed, dwellings swept from their foundations, the forest uprooted, and the crops beaten down and destroyed. Never, never, never was there such desolation and ruin. There's also no way for us to understand the wind speed or what the official rating would have been. However, it's pretty apparent from the clues that we have based on the eyewitness reports that this was in the upper echelon of violent tornadoes. May 3rd, 1999 is one of, if not the most infamous day in the recent weather enterprise. The environment that spawned what is widely recognized as the strongest tornado in recent history, the Bridge Creek Moore tornado, wasn't the only violent tornado that spawned on this day. The outbreak was far from over. The historic tornado touched down late on May 3rd, 1999, at 9.25 p.m., just a few hours after the Bridge Creek Moore tornado has gone through. The massive tornado would travel over 35 miles throughout its lifetime and is reported to have easily exceeded one mile in width. The town of Mulhall took the brunt of this horrifying storm. Over 60% of homes would be destroyed, including essential structures like the elementary school and city's water tower. The tornado would ultimately dissipate around 10.45 p.m., but the night wasn't over for Logan County in the areas of Mulhall. Another F3 tornado would actually hit the same counties, the surrounding counties near Mulhall, causing a lot of damage, which ultimately would be virtually indistinguishable with some of the damage that happened earlier from the Mulhall tornado. So some of these areas were actually hit more than once. Ultimately, two people would be killed in Mulhall. Now this is where it starts to get interesting. Meteorologist and storm chaser Roger Edwards believes that this tornado was as violent or perhaps more violent than the Bridge Creek Moore Oklahoma tornado. And remember, the Bridge Creek Moore tornado had a recorded wind speed of 301 miles per hour. So this is a really big claim for someone to make. Now, like the Bridge Creek Moore tornado, a Doppler on wheels was also present during this storm. So earlier they had captured the Bridge Creek Moore tornado and subsequently continued on throughout the night and would capture the Mulhall tornado as well. And shockingly, the Doppler on wheels would document the Mulhall tornado as the largest ever observed core flow circulation with a distance of 5,200 feet between peak velocities on either side of the tornado with around a four mile width of peak wind gust exceeding 96 miles per hour, which quantitatively would make it the widest tornado ever recorded by far. Joshua Werman, who, as many of you know, is the engineer and creator of the Doppler on Wheels, and Dr. Lee would go on to analyze the 3D structure of the storm in a later report in 2005, published in an article in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. So if Mulhall was recorded as supposedly the widest tornado in history, why is it not regarded as, why do we not accept it as widest tornado in recorded history? I thought it was El Reno. Well, I've been working on trying to find a good response and I don't have a definitive answer for you. I've read some people saying that Mulhall is sort of cheated out of being considered the widest tornado in history and I don't think that's the case at all. From what I understand, the wind speeds are 
quantifiably the widest, but aren't necessarily considered tornadic wind speeds that would need to be the actual widest in recorded history. I think that there's an abundance of data and the storm has been extensively analyzed and there's a reason why it's not considered the widest storm in history. I don't think it's been cheated out of, I trust the scientists and so take that as you will. I'll be leaving links to the studies that are done down below if you'd like to take a look if you're someone who enjoys reading the the physics and mathematics that are involved in, in the measurements, um, just in case you want to look at them. For number eight, we are going to be talking about two separate events, both of which are twins. The concept of twin tornadoes and meteorology is one that elicits excitement and awe and fear all at the same time. There are several really incredible and horrifying examples of twin tornadoes throughout the decades, but these are the two that stick out to me the most. Palm Sunday outbreak of 1965 is still one of the most infamous and deadly in American history. With over 47 confirmed tornadoes throughout six states, 137 fatalities, and over 1,200 injuries, this is certainly one of the most impactful events. And I'm talking specifically about the Palm Sunday twins. These twin tornadoes are from Dunlap, Indiana, as they pass through Elkhart. This was just one example of several incredibly violent tornadoes that passed through on the Palm Sunday outbreak. One woman even quotes that the Palm Sunday twins, seeing them in person, was the closest to hell that she will ever be. Truthfully, the 1965 Palm Sunday outbreak is so notable in the weather enterprise that I will likely cover it at some point uh, because there's a lot to it. The next set of twins I want to talk about are quite recent. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about, the 2014 Pilger twins. On the afternoon of June 16th, 2014, a tornado outbreak was underway in southeast Nebraska. Multiple tornadoes would spawn from several different supercells across the state, but by far the most interesting were the Pilger twins. Six miles southwest of the town of Pilger, not one, but two tornadoes would form and ultimately cross paths, producing one of the most seemingly unimaginable images. Two massive, low precipitation, photogenic twin tornadoes. The twins would tear through the northern and central plains of Nebraska, killing two, injuring several more people, and causing F4 intensity damage for both of them. Again, this is really unheard of. Not one violent tornado in a set of two, but both were violent. Although I'm positive most of you have already seen it already, if you haven't and you want to check out in-depth video of the twins, go check out Pecos Hank's video on it. It's extremely well documented as always. On May 22nd, 2004, a tornado outbreak was ongoing through portions of central Iowa and southeastern Nebraska. By 7.30 p.m., a small F1 intensity tornado forms just southwest of Dakin, Nebraska, causing minimal damage to silos. But as the storm continued to grow, it was apparent that it was far from over. Just a few minutes after 8.30 p.m., the tornado now rapidly strengthened to high-end F4 intensity, just as it's reaching the town of Hallam. It's now 2.5 miles wide, the widest in recorded history at the time. The town of Hallam took intense damage, with most of the homes and farms taking some kind of intense structural damage, if not being completely destroyed. Ultimately, the tornado would end up with an F4 rating with one fatality and 38 injuries. At the time, this was a really groundbreaking record. A 2.5 mile wide tornado is almost unfathomably large. And we have to remember that this record wouldn't be broken until the 2013 El Reno tornado, which is only a little bit wider than, than this tornado was. But in its own right, the Hallam tornado uh, really holds its own as being certainly one of the widest and, um, frankly, eeriest tornadoes in recent history. And for some reason, goes forgotten a lot of the time. Number 
Number 10 is the 2007 Ellie Manitoba tornado. On June 22nd, 2007, Canada got its first and last F5 tornado and certainly one of the most photogenic tornadoes I've ever seen. Unfortunately, the town of Eli took a direct hit. Many homes were completely destroyed and some were even blown off their foundation, which of course is indicative of extreme violence. Two semi-trucks were even blown off the road. It's uh, very apparent that this was certainly a violent tornado. Fortunately, the town of Eli was uh, quite small and there were actually no fatalities with this tornado. The saving grace during this event was that most of the town had actually left to attend a high school graduation ceremony. So although the town and several buildings took intense structural damage, there were no serious injuries, no fatalities. Could have been a lot worse. Tornadoes like this one are particularly scary to me because they are an example of how tornadoes, violent tornadoes can happen in areas where we at the very least expect them. This goes along with the sort of stereotypes and myths that have been perpetuated for decades, if not centuries, about the behaviors of tornadoes that people typically expect. And time and time again, those are proven to be wrong. And this is a classic example of being proven wrong. And I hope by using some of these very anomalous events as examples, we can sort of start taking into account that although very rare, uh, these types of events do happen and we need to really stop believing in these really old, out-of-date myths about storms and tornadoes. All right, so that is my top 10 list of uh, tornado events that make me lose sleep at night. I don't think any event will ever top Gerald and Joplin for me in terms of being horrifying. Those two have always been and probably will always be at the very top of my list for events that are just so horrifying to me. But I've already done two incredibly in-depth videos on those. If you haven't seen them, I'll link some cards. I do have a Twitch channel now. I'm not always going to be talking about tornadoes on there. I do like to play video games. So if you want to follow my Twitch, you can. Go check out my Twitter if you would like to see more daily updates from me, I guess. I think that's everything. As always, thank you all so much for watching today's video. I really appreciate it. I will see you all in the next one. Bye.